From KGW News, this is Straight Talk with Laurel Porter. Hello and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Laurel Porter. Maybe you've seen the billboards or the ads on TV calling out Portland city leaders and other elected officials for not acting more boldly to fix some of the city's biggest problems like homelessness, trash and graffiti, public safety. A nonprofit advocacy group called People for Portland is behind the messages. Here's part of a video from their website with a mother and son, Debbie and Josh, who are homeless, living in a van near Lentz in Portland. If the politicians could live in our shoes for, you know, a day, a weekend, or a week, or a, a month, and I don't mean just like camping, I mean like out at one of the turnouts or, you know, amongst a, a, one of the camps where there's a, a whole group of people that have been staying there for a long time. I'd like to tell the politicians to cut the red tape because they would get many of us off the street. The group's founders say the message to elected leaders is similar. No matter the person's background or situation or politics, they want urgent action now and they want to see results. How did people for Portland get started? Who's behind it? What's their objective? And are they seeing any results? In this episode of Straight Talk, we talk with the co-founders of People for Portland. Kevin Looper is a principal at Wheelhouse Northwest and is a longtime Democratic consultant. Dan Levy is a partner and president of Gallatin Public Affairs. He served as strategist for former Republican U.S. Senator mm -hmm. Gordon Smith and advises Oregon business interests. Welcome to Straight Talk, Kevin and Dan. It's nice to have you here. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Kevin, you both represent different sides of the political spectrum and have often found yourselves on opposite sides of an issue. How did you two end up teaming up to start People for Portland? Well, it is funny because Dan and I know each other mostly as adversaries, uh, but we are both the kind of folks whose phone rings when people don't know what to do. Um, and in this case, uh, we called each other because neither of us knew what to do. Um, uh, it's a perplexing problem when you look around um, the trash, the homelessness, the, the public safety problems that we endure here in um, Portland. Um, but what's more perplexing for folks that know the way government works is that you would normally expect government to do a better job of pandering to the will of people than what we're seeing ar around us. Um, we need politicians to have the courage of our convictions. And uh, what we heard at first was a lot of people thinking that there was sort of a single bullet solution. You just recall the mayor or recall the DA or launch a lawsuit. Um, and, uh, and what we knew is it, it would take a bigger effort than that to really put all the pieces together. And more importantly, there was an incredibly important gap between what elected officials were talking about and, and where the public was. And we needed to find a way to get the public voice into this debate. Well, let me bring Dan in. What, what is the main objective of People for Portland? We have, well, the main objective is to get more people involved in, uh, in their democracy and in urging elected officials to take action and then get results. The three issue areas that we're focused on are public safety, uh, restoring public safety, which has never been more important uh, in this year of, of violence and, and record murders in, in the city. Uh, homelessness and specifically getting more people more quickly off the streets and into shelter situations as the first step towards a longer term, more permanent housing solution. The proliferation, proliferation of camps and tents around the city uh, is, you know, a humanitarian crisis. There's nothing compassionate about letting people live on the streets. And then the final piece is the garbage and trash and toxic waste that has uh, overcome every area of the city. Some of that is a derivative of the homeless camps, but not all of it. But the inability of our elected officials and our government to simply clean up the city uh, or keep the city clean. I mean, I'm, or, I'm, I'm a native Oregonian. Uh, you know, our ethic here is keep Oregon green, pick up litter, all that kind of stuff. We've banned all sorts of products over the years, uh, concerned about litter. And now, you know, our city is, is a dump. And uh, um, so those are the three issue areas that we're focused on. Well, you launched 10 weeks ago in August, but you did some polling before that in May. The survey by FM3 Research did more than 800 interviews with Portlanders and found three in five voters feel negatively about Portland's direction, especially downtown. And when it comes to homelessness, voters said they believe tent encampments are a humanitarian emergency requiring urgent action. And that was by a margin of 84 percent to 12 percent. They also support a proposal for safe villages. Kevin, and you're not just talking about city leaders, right? 
Oh, no, absolutely not. One of the problems we have here in Portland is the incredible layers of government where we've got uh, Portland, we've got the county, we've got uh, TriMet, we've got the port, uh, we've got whatever you describe Metro as, um, uh, all on top of each other and all pointing their fingers at each other about who's responsible. Well, what's your biggest fear, Kevin? Boy, um, my biggest fear is that... Um, that as we talk about these problems, we don't get enough done on the timeline of the problems themselves. All the experts we talked to in all of these areas painted a very similar picture of Portland having about two years or so to change the economic and social behaviors in a way that kept it as special of a place as it is, that allowed people to come downtown for festivals and for business and people to have the neighborhood they need to have to remain in Portland. Um, and the timeline of the discussion I noticed right away when we started talking to government officials was, what could we do on a horizon of the next five to really 10 years? And establishing points of, we'll have meetings and talk about things, but we've been talking about Portland having a homeless crisis for six years. We've been talking about body cams for longer than that. And, uh, and we cannot uh, any longer be satisfied with just process. We've got to actually have outcomes that matter. Well, people from Portland. Laurel, Laurel, yes, Laurel I want to address that too. Um, I'd say another significant concern we have is that people are going to become numb, comfortably or uncomfortably numb, to the situation in which we find ourselves right now. And they'll become cynical, they'll become disengaged, and they'll accept the decline and decay that we're experiencing in our city. For, Portland is not a foregone conclusion. It, it took generations of leaders and citizens to make this city the special place that it, it is and will be once again, but right now is not. And cities are fragile ecosystems. People are gonna make decisions every day about where to locate their office where to shop, whether to come downtown to visit a cultural institution. They're gonna make decisions with their dollars. They're gonna decide whether to shop at Bridgeport Village or come to Nordstrom downtown. Every day those decisions are being made. Well, Dan, let me jump and in. Once people, change their once people change their behavior, it's hard to get it back. Well, let me jump in here because People for Portland has said 177,240 emails have been sent to elected officials through your portal. Our KGW investigative team did some digging through a public records request and found in the two months before People for Portland launched, Mayor Wheeler alone mm. received 9,158 emails. And in the two months since the People for Portland campaign started in August, that number has more than doubled. The mayor has received more than 20,000 emails in that period. Uh, Dan, do you think all of those complaints, all those emails are having any tangible results? Because one of the criticisms I'm hearing is you both and your group seem to be stoking public frustration without really offering real solutions. Well, we put out a very specific uh, plan on public safety. Um, body cameras um, to create more accountability for people on both sides of the law, an expanded Portland street response uh, program and additional police officers on the streets. Portland right now has 300 fewer officers than we should have at our minimum staffing levels. Now we put those items out. Just in March, Laurel, just in March, the city rejected expanding the Portland street response. They've been talking about body cameras for six to seven years. And we've had an underfunded, understaffed uh, police bureau for going on almost a decade. And so, just this week, uh, the mayor announced a very important initiative on all three of those items. 300 more police officers over three years, a vote on body cameras, and a expanded Portland's street response. So those are three very specific things that we've been talking about, that we've put on the agenda, that we've been encouraging people to advocate for, that the elected officials uh, have announced this week, and in the upcoming week are gonna be voting on before council. Let's talk a little bit more about that announcement from the city and county. Let's hear what Mayor Ted Wheeler had to say about it. People will begin to see the results relatively quickly, but I also want to be clear, we're hiring new positions and we're establishing new programs or expanding existing ones. That obviously doesn't happen overnight. 
And, and Kevin, critics of people for Portland say your campaign makes it look like nothing is happening when it comes to addressing homelessness. We, we see what the city and county announced this week, but the county says it has made significant progress. We have a couple of maps. The first one shows the number of shelters before the housing emergency was declared in 2015. And a second map shows the number of shelters around the area as of last month. Multnomah County says it went from providing shelter beds for 650 people back then to providing space to house 2,000 people going into this winter. In addition, money from the Metro Bond will provide supportive housing for another 2,200 people. So, so Kevin, that's not nothing. Isn't that significant? Well, we're not saying nothing. Critics may think we're trying to make it seem like nothing is happening, but Portland is making it seem like nothing is happening. Just people looking around is, uh, is where that problem is. But I would only point out that things aren't happening fast enough and not enough is happening. That's for certain. When they launched the Joint Office of Homelessness between the city and the county, they said they'd be providing 4,500 uh, places a year. Now they're trying to brag about having 2,000. Take that to the scale of the problem we actually have on the streets, the humanitarian catastrophe that is happening every night on the streets. I helped pass a $2.5 billion uh, homeless services uh, uh, measure through Metro, in which we promised that we were going to address the homeless crisis on the street. And the plans for that are all about a 10 year horizon, like I mentioned before. We don't have 10 years to to reclaim the city that we love. We need to be doing things on a human scale, which means doing something to solve the problems tomorrow better than we did it today and moving people off the street as fast as we possibly can. If this were a, a flood, if this was a natural disaster, we would have solutions for people. We are frankly way too comfortable leaving people on the streets as a waiting room for Nirvana manana. We need to be doing things today. Your group has also gotten some pushback from folks who want to know about who is behind this movement, where all the money is coming from. It's been called dark money. You're a registered 501c4 nonprofit, so you don't legally have to divulge that. Columbia Sports, whereas Tim Boyle is the only backer that I know of who's come forward publicly. Why don't others come forward publicly, Dan? Well, I wish they would. Um, but in an environment that we're in right now, you know, Commissioner Dan Ryan last year cast a vote uh, at the city council related to policing and found his yard being set on fire. Uh, a woman who appeared in one of our videos uh, who has a coffee shop near the east end of the Ross Island Bridge, uh, the day after the video went on the air, her, her business was vandalized with, with eggs uh, and other vandalism. So we're li unfortunately, we're living in an environment where people feel uh, that they're, they're speech can be threatened and intimidated. And the reason C4 organizations were created was to protect the anonymity of people to be able to have their speech. I generally think that people who have a concern about our money are actually more concerned about our message. And right now, you know, we have uh, in just 10 weeks, we've delivered, you know, 175,000 emails to elected officials, close to 7,000 people have taken action uh, on our, on, through our website portal. Uh, people are thousands of people are visiting our website every day, close to 5,000 or over 5,000 people have, have uh, joined us on Facebook in just 10, 10 weeks. So, you know, we're, we're trying to give voice to uh, Portlanders. Uh, that's the primary thing that we're doing and that the money allows us to do that. And the evidence of the money is in the polling that people can see on our website, the advertising that they can see on television, the action that they can take on our website. Well, KGW political yeah, analyst could, Len Bergstein, I'd like to just jump in here, Kevin. He, he was also a lobbyist. You may know him. He said, by hiding the source of your funding, it's hard to know the group's true motives and, and who stands to benefit. And here's what he told us. They've tried to monetize our pain about the public anxiety about things like uh, homelessness and the police issues. And they've tried to kind of like hide who their supporters are. I've been in this business for about 50 years. And whenever I represented somebody to a government and wanted to influence them or lobby a decision, I had to declare who my client was. I couldn't intentionally hide or disguise who really wanted to see something happen. It, People for Portland has chosen 
to do that on purpose. And so they've intentionally hidden who the private interests are that would like to see something happen. And they've tried to wrap that in a wrapper of public interest. Well, Kevin, let me let you react to that. Is this a way for secret private interests to push their agenda? <laughs> no, the agenda we push is right online. And, and we show that it's got all of the agenda items have 75% of public support. There's, there's nothing here that's any different than any other advocacy group that you know about. Environmentalists, choice groups, none of them divulge their donors. And there's a reason for it, which is that we have the right to free assembly and free speech in this country. And there are real consequences for people who step out. I felt them myself. Um, cancel culture is real. And in Portland, there's a lot of animosity politically around uh, uh, both far left and far right um, politics. And, and so those of us who are trying to bring forth a middle way uh, here of, of, of making progress um, can suffer from both sides of that. So I understand why donors may not want to step forward. But the agenda is very public. And the people who are being served, that's the thing that I really think is missed uh, in this by Len and others uh, here. The, the people who benefit that he references, people who benefit is the public. We're serving the common good. And the agenda items are very clear and are posted. So there's no sort of secret benefit to somebody who gives money. They're doing it because they love Portland and they don't want to see it continue to go down the drain. Well, Dan and Kevin, let me ask you, how much are you guys personally profiting from people for Portland? Dan, can you tell us what your salary is, how much you're making off of this? Well, we're being paid. That is true. We don't work for free, uh, but we're not disclosing, you know, where we spend all our dollars. Um, people can look and see what we spent on your channel uh, at KGW running our advertisements because that's public knowledge uh, or publicly available. But no, we're not disclosing our donors and we're not disclosing uh, uh, our, our expenditures. Uh, well, Amit, we got a hold of one of our documents that said we have a, a budget goal of, of, a, of $1.5 million. So that's been in the, in the public domain. Um, but other than that, that's, uh, that's all that we're gonna say. All right, Dan and Kevin, time for well, us to take I, a break. I, I need to go to a break now. Here's the website if you'd like to find out more about People for Portland. When we come back, we'll look at public safety. People for Portland just released a new TV ad supporting the hiring of more Portland police officers. We're back in two minutes. Welcome back to Straight Talk, I'm Laurel Porter. We're taking a look at the nonprofit People for Portland with the group's founders, Dan Levy and Kevin Looper. Once again, welcome. And you guys just released a new ad that people may start seeing calling for the city to fund the hiring of more Portland police officers. Let's take a look at the ad. Portland needs bolder action than just 25 more cops to end the record shootings and murders. Commissioner Maps has a plan. Reform the police and hire 300 newly trained officers. 87% of Portlanders support the plan, but Commissioner Hardesty opposes more police. Now it's time for Commissioners Ryan and Rubio to choose. Tell the mayor and city council to support the MAPS plan and restore safety to our city. In September, you did some additional polling. Uh, Kevin and Dan with GS Strategy Group on public safety. It showed 87% supported a plan that includes, as we saw in the ad, hiring more officers, requiring body-worn cameras for police, and expanding Portland Street response. Does this represent a shift from where many voters in the city were last year when council cut funding to the police bureau by millions, Dan? Absolutely. Um, and it's a tragic circumstance of the rising crime and violence in our city, record crime and violence in our city. Um, so yeah, there's been a, a dramatic uh, shift. Uh, I don't know, frankly, last year, because I never saw any public opinion polling on whether people actually supported defunding the police uh, uh, in terms of, of the general public. There were large uh, activist voices that wanted it. Um, so I think it's a positive change. The other important thing to note is since we released that ad, uh, the mayor announced uh, his plan and uh, indicated there's three votes on council for it. So it appears that next week uh, the city council will be moving forward with three votes, and we hope that uh, we hope there be five votes. My guess is there are, we have a, we have an option maybe to get four. And Kevin, you were telling me earlier that you want to get the entire council on record on this issue. Yeah, this is the thing that our critics hate the most at it, is that we're naming names and putting pressure on folks to actually take a specific position. 
Um, and that's what that ad did, and that's what it took. Uh, that, and by the way, we, we held a, a, a town hall on Zoom um, uh, that the mayor joined. Um, uh, I think a great decision on him, and we welcome that he did, but we expected 250 people, and we got 5,000 people listening in and, uh, and following on Facebook and on the, on the Zoom. And uh, we are making it like an election day every day uh, for, the, for the folks who are in elected office. And it makes a difference when they hear from folks. All of this success depends on individuals acting. That's the thing we're doing is providing a platform. And they hate it. And the animosity that comes from it, you mentioned before that, you know, how much money are we making off this? I can answer that easier than Dan. I've lost 150000 in just work this year from Democratic uh, uh, and progressive sources canceling me because I'm out there putting pressure on them. And you know what? I don't care. I've got a seven-year-old. I've got a raise in this city. And this stuff needs to happen. So I'll take that chance. And I'll be one of our biggest investors if that's what it takes. Um, but we need more people to step up and take actions because it really does make a difference. We can't become numb, like Dan said, to what's going on around us. You talked about naming names. Yeah, I mean, oral, and, oral. I, let me just go on oh, to this because oh, we're, we're running Sorry. out of time here. But you talked about naming names. The new spot is pretty pointed against Commissioner Hardesty, who's running for re-election and also directed at Commissioners Ryan and Rubio. The IRS rules for a 501c4 nonprofit say the organization shouldn't directly or indirectly intervene in political campaigns on behalf of or in opposition to any candidate. So, Dan, is this new ad really in the spirit of a 501c social welfare organization? Absolutely. We're not advocating to elect them one candidate versus another. This is issue advocacy. They are elected officials. They are serving on the council and they're going to vote on these important matters. So that's exactly what issue advocacy groups were designed and, and, and created legally to do. And Dan, I interrupted you. Uh, did you want to add something else to what Kevin said earlier? Well, I was just going to say none of this works. People for Portland doesn't work if people don't take action. If people don't go to the website, sign up, come to a town hall, send an email, send a text, make a phone call, none of this works unless the people do that. So that was our great experiment. 10 weeks ago, we launched this. We didn't know what would happen. We hoped people would get involved and take action. Um, and you know, we've provided a roadmap on the issues that we think the city council needs to work on and the county commission and Metro. We're also suggesting to state legislators that through, through uh, sending them emails that they get more involved in these issues because it's gonna take every elected official at every level of government uh, acting more boldly, more quickly with greater urgency to save the city that we love. And I can give you each about 45 seconds to wrap things up in a final message for our viewers. We'll start with Kevin. Well, you know, the problem here is that too many people run for office wanting to be something when what we need is for them to do something. And so this is a mechanism to try to force people to do things. And I'm a progressive, uh, and unlike Dan, I come from this from a different angle, but I do believe that for a city that is dominated by democratic politics, accountability can't be a dirty word. We have to embrace it. We actually have to deliver what we say we're gonna do. And when we talk about solving homelessness, it can't just end with talk and having more meetings. It's gotta end with people actually having a safe sanitary place to put your head at night. If you attack homelessness from the right, it says that so many people say you don't have a right to sleep on the streets. And if you attack it just from the left, you say you don't have a right to tell anybody where to, to uh, live or how. OK, Dan, I got to let Dan have a, a final word here. Space where, just where a, people want to have solutions. 30 Go seconds ahead. for Dan. Ahead, Dan. I'll just ask everybody to pick up their phone. Go to peopleforportland.org. Uh, and send a message and, and an email to uh, the uh, city council and the county commission and what have you that we've got available on there. Read our polling, find out you know where people are standing, uh, follow us on Facebook and get involved because this is your city, this is our city. And uh, what we're trying to do is just to provide a platform for more people to get involved in their democracy and with their government and to make their voice heard with their elected officials. Okay, and Portland here is, is that. Portland is a wonderful place with a great future. Here is that People for Portland website if you want to have more information. And thank you once again to my guests, Kevin Looper and Dan Levy. And thank you for watching and listening, and we'll see you next week for Straight Talk.